Welcome to the Bergeron Forum, everyone. Um, we just have two announcements today. Uh, first, next week's Bergeron Forum on September the 16th will be Frederick Baudry. Um, the title of the talk is Counting Birds at 45, 68 and 71 North and in between. He'll be talking about the decline of bird populations and his experiences doing field work in Alaska. Um, this evening, uh, 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 marking 20 years since 9-11, there'll be a panel discussion at 5.30 in the lobby of Herrick Library. The title of that discussion is 9-11 and Afghanistan 20 years after. And the panelists will be AU faculty members, Andrew Kless, um, Danny Gagney and Gary Ostrauer, and also Francisco Morales, Director of Military Aligned Program at St. Bonaventure University. Both Andrew Kless and Francisco Morales served in Afghanistan during their time with the US Army. Today, we're delighted to have Meredith Field, Assistant Professor of Sociology, and the title of her talk will be More Dangerous Than COVID, The Threat of Critical Race Theory. So thank you, Meredith. Thank you so much, Amaris. Let me just share my presentation here. Let's see if I can get this. All right, can everybody see that? Yep. Okay, great. All right, so I have a lot to say about this topic. I'm um, organizing it around four main questions that I'll go through, but I'm probably gonna speak quickly because I really wanna get through a lot today. Um, I'm trained in sociology and gender studies, and most of my research and scholarship focus on healthcare access and equity. But when I was in grad school, I was introduced to the concept of intersectionality, which was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. And I became really inspired by her work, which is how I became interested in critical race theory. I've been studying critical race theory for the past two years now um, from Dr. Crenshaw and other people who actually developed it. The reason why I chose this topic for my Berggren lecture is because of something that happened to me this summer. At some point, I think probably in June, I went to the beach to meet up with one of my cousins. We both have nine-year-old sons, and last year during the pandemic, she sent her son to school, and I kept my son home. I kept my son home partially because I was caring for a parent with cancer, but also because I didn't fully trust that the schools knew how to keep my son safe from COVID. During the conversation with my cousin, I thought she was going to ask me about you're sending Harrison back to school. Do you feel like it's gonna be safe? And when I told her I was sending him back to school, the first thing she said was, do they teach critical race theory there? And I thought it was really odd. And I said, I don't think so. Why do they teach it at your son's school? And she said, probably all the schools are teaching it now. And I found it so strange. And I thought I've been studying critical race theory and I find it hard to believe that it's being taught in elementary schools. So a quick Google search, you can see a bunch of headlines here and a picture from a school board meeting brought up many different stories of parents who are supposedly very upset about critical race theory being taught in their children's schools. And I asked my cousin, do you know what critical race theory is? And she said, no, but I don't think that race and racism should be discussed in schools. Little kids shouldn't be worrying about it. Then I revealed to her that I actually know quite a lot about critical race theory and that I teach about it in some of my sociology courses, and then it was created by legal scholars, and then I doubted it was being taught in elementary schools. I chose not to engage with my cousin about her claim that children shouldn't be having to think about race and racism, because race is actually a social fact, and kids get confronted with it somewhat on a daily basis, depending on the kid, depending on if they're white, a person of color, where they live, what's going on in their lives. So I moved on from that, but I kept thinking about how interesting this was. So today I'm gonna to cover four questions. The first one is what I'm gonna spend most of my time on, what is critical race theory? Because a lot of public polls show that most people have an opinion about critical race theory, but they don't actually know anything about it. Then I'm gonna talk about where CRT came from. I'm gonna keep referring to it as CRT to save myself some syllables. And why are we as an American public talking about CRT at this moment in time? And then last, why does it matter that CRT is being framed as dangerous? At a time when we're living through a pandemic, many parents are more concerned with whether CRT is being taught in their kid's classroom than their kid's physical safety and protection from COVID. Okay. So here's a really basic critical race theory. I'm gonna start at the bottom actually with the theory 
part. So it's a theory, it's an analytical tool. And it's one that focuses on race as both a symbolic aspect of our society and one with material consequences. So some examples there, social consequences like um, access to resources, experiences in education, experiences in the workplace. And we contextualize it when we use CRT within the socio-political, the historical, the economic, and other social institutions and disciplines. Because it's a critical theory, it analyzes power structures, social institutions, and cultural assumptions. So just to summarize, I would say that CRT is a tool that allows social scientists to critically analyze both the symbolic construction of race and the material consequences of racialized social structures. So because this is a theory that was developed by legal scholars, it has mostly over time been applied to analyzing the law critically. And I have several examples here that I just want to bring to your attention. The first one is what is commonly referred to as the constitutional slave clause, which is written there. It prohibited, let's see, I can't see all my screen, one second. Prohibited the federal government from limiting the importation of persons understood at that time to mean primarily enslaved African persons where the existing state government saw fit to allow it until some 20 years after the constitution took effect. So this is from the very beginning of the United States, we have used the law to define race, legalize slavery and create racism, right? Another example is the you know, various naturalization acts. Over time, the law was using the naturalization acts to try to define the concept of race, to define whiteness, to define citizenship. And so with each naturalization act, the definitions of these things were tweaked a little bit and modified a little bit to fit the needs of the, those in power at the time. So two other examples that I wanna talk about are two Supreme Court cases here, the Ozawa case and the Fend case. And there are many different cases, Supreme Court cases and otherwise, that function to legally define race and whiteness and non-whiteness. But these two cases are very important ones and I'll explain why. So Takao Ozawa was from Japan, but he had been in the US his entire adult life. He applied for citizenship and it was denied. He argued that he should be considered white and deserving of citizenship, both because of his patriotic actions. So he, had, he was speaking perfect English. He had taught his children English. They were going to you know, American schools and an American church. And also because of the lightness of his skin, he said that he should count as a white person. But the court said, no, you don't count as a white person because we are legally defining whiteness based on Caucasian descent. And you can see there in the court's ruling, they also have kind of a loose definition of Caucasian, but they're saying that he doesn't fit in. What we now hold is that the words free white persons are words of common speech to be interpreted in accordance with the understanding of the common man, synonymous with the word Caucasian, only as that term is popularly understood. So this is a Supreme Court ruling. The second case that, um, happened at almost the same time was the Bhagat Singh Thin case. He was born in 1892 in the Indian state of Punjab, which is the heart of the country's Sikh community. His family was of a prominent caste and his dad was a spiritual leader. He went to college in India and he was really a budding Sikh philosophy expert, you know? So he decided to move to the US for more opportunities. When he got here, he got a job he went to graduate school at Berkeley and eventually he joined the US military. Then after that, he became an esteemed religious philosopher in the US. He first applied for citizenship in Washington state in 1918. He lost that four days later when an immigration officer argued that he wasn't white. So the court case that went to the Supreme Court asks, is a high caste Hindu of full Indian blood considered a white person. And Thind argued that he was literally Caucasian. He was from the Caucasus Mountains, 
And he was from an upper caste that looks down upon other races. So parallel to the US system of whites having power and black people being enslaved. The court said, nope, high caste Hindus of full Indian blood, not Caucasian and not free white persons. So journalist and professor of journalism, Audrey Quinn says that this ruling is especially important because the thin case, the Supreme Court claimed to define race from a scientific, before the thin case, the Supreme Court claimed to, to define race from a scientific perspective. But as race science was becoming weaker and wasn't really working for the courts anymore, they had to figure out a different way to define race. Quinn says that the thin ruling effectively said, science has in some ways betrayed us because it's including all sorts of people that we don't want to believe are white. So we're gonna jettison science and we're gonna say the only people who are white in terms of being able to join the country are the sorts of people that we as a country believe are white. And that moment really crystallized that white is something that's socially constructed. Whiteness, whiteness is a social construction. It's produced by cultural practices. In other words, the court was happy to rely on science when it confirmed the court's prejudice, but when the science challenged that president, pre prejudice, they abandoned it and continued with a racial project with no scientific justification. Okay. Another example that you might have heard of before is the Washington v. Davis case. And this is important because this is about um, people who applied to become Washington DC police officers. At the time in the 1970s, DC was using a civil service exam called Test 21 to select who could matriculate into officer training school. And you can see here on the slide that really this test tested verbal skills. It didn't test anything else that has to do with being an effective police officer in Washington, DC. You can see a sample test question on the right. The saying straight trees are the first to be felled means most nearly, and then choose one of these. And the fact that this exam was failed by black applicants four times as often as by white applicants. So two black applicants who failed the exam sued the police department claiming that it used discriminatory hiring practices. They cited that the black applicants failed the exam at a rate four times of the white applicants and that the exam didn't test any knowledge needed to be an effective police officer. For example, it didn't address skills necessary for policing, for working in an urban environment or for interacting with people of color. But the court said, this test is not discriminatory because there's no intent to discriminate. And so effectively, it's legal to use hiring practices that have a discriminatory and inequitable effect as long as there was no intent of discrimination at the onset of the, of the process, right? So this is another way that a CRT analysis would say that race and racism are being legally enforced and that this is what we call systemic racism, the material consequences of race that are part of our social structures and institutions. All right, one more example I wanna talk about is this saying, driving well black. You might've heard of it before, especially if you're a person of color, you're probably familiar with it. And I have this great little comic to kind of illustrate the point. Um, but the phrase driving well black essentially means if you are black and if you are driving, then you are likely to be pulled over and you face greater consequences than a white person who is pulled over. There is another court case I'm gonna mention that relates to this, and it is Wren versus the United States, which is relatively recent, 1996. Two people were pulled over for failing to use their turn signal in an area that was considered to be a high drug use area. The plainclothes police officers who pulled them over searched their truck and found drugs. The plaintiffs then sued saying that the officers used the traffic violation as a pretext for stopping the truck because they lacked either reasonable suspicion or probable cause to stop them on suspicion of drug dealing. The court held that it's actually legal for officers to stop anyone if the officers have reasonable cause to believe, believe that a traffic violation occurred. And there are two important implications for this ruling. The traffic code is really complex and most of us make multiple errors every time we drive within the first few minutes. 
often without even realizing that we're making errors. So the first implication is that if an officer wanted to pull you over, if they saw you in your car and they thought you looked suspicious for some reason, anything about you, doesn't matter how they're judging you, why they're judging you, they could simply follow you until they see you make an error in driving, break some rule, and then pull you over and try to search your vehicle and get more information about what's going on. The other important implication is that people of color will be subject to this more than white people. And so a CRT analysis says that the ruling has a discriminatory impact on people of color. There is actually data that supports this. For example, data on 20 million traffic stops in North Carolina found that blacks are 63% more likely to be stopped even though as a whole, they drive 16% less in North Carolina. And taking that into account, they were 95% more likely to be stopped. Additionally, blacks were 115% more likely than whites to be searched in a traffic stop. Yet contraband was more likely to be found in searches of white drivers. So this is definitely the kind of case and um, claim that critical race theory would be useful in discussing. That's just one example. Um, CRT is also applied to other topics as a way to show systemic racism, um, property valuation, credit scores, predictive policing, and the problems with that. Healthcare practices, that's an area I'm especially interested in as a healthcare researcher. So let's go to where did CRT really come from? And just as kind of this reminder of what it is, two of the probably most prominent legal scholars who use CRT now, Kimberly Crenshaw and Devin Carbato, you know, they have been talking about how CRT was developed to reveal the ways in which race is embedded in legal doctrine and that much of what shapes the racial experience in the US is because of the law. As you can see, CRT came out of critical legal studies. It came from legal scholars and law students. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. So in 1981, this is kind of the post-civil rights era, Kimberly Crenshaw goes to Harvard specifically to study with Derek Bell. Oh, and I'm sorry, I cut off the K in his name. I see the photos over it, I apologize. So she goes there to study with him. And when she gets there, she finds out that he has left the institution because he was frustrated with the lack of diversity in the curriculum, in the faculty, even in the student body to some level, even though Harvard had been increasing student diversity. And he was also frustrated with Harvard's um, lack of valuing his contributions in terms of his scholarship and teaching in issues of race and the law. <clears throat> so, Kimberly Crenshaw was pretty um, frustrated by the fact that Derek Bell had left and why he had left. And there were other students in her cohort who were also frustrated. So they decide to organize to de demand a more diverse faculty and curriculum, but Harvard ignores them. And instead that year they hired 10 new law faculty and they were all white men. So this photo is Kimberly Crenshaw and Mari Matsuda, another originator of CRT. These two decided that they would organize an alternate course on race and the law that they were offering because Harvard refused to offer this kind of course. And I use Casey for short sometimes when I'm talking about Dr. Crenshaw. Um, I have never had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her before, but because I've attended so many virtual classes with her and discussions with her and seen her at so many conferences, I feel like I know her really well. So. She coined the term critical race theory because she wanted to address the limitations of conventional civil rights law, the limitations of how diversity was applied to elite higher education institutions and to rewrite how equity should be understood. I just wanted to show you this quick list of some of the um, key originators in critical race theory and point out that they all come from really, really reputable institutions where they were educated and also have had highly esteemed careers. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw, for example, has appointments at both Columbia Law School and UCLA Law School. Okay, so why are we talking about CRT? Let me just check the time. 
Okay, great. We're good. So I wanted to just give you, this is kind of like a little list of key things that happen. Christopher Rufo comes on the scene in 2020. Then we have executive order 13950. There's kind of a media explosion because of an organized campaign and state bans running rampant right now is where we are. And there's one tweet here from Christopher Rufo because you'll see, why are we talking about it? Um, spoiler alert is that this was all orchestrated by a handful of people and specifically Christopher Rufo as a leader. And he has recently tweeted, the goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. We have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. So definitely an aspect of culture wars and trying to divide the American public. So who's Christopher Rufo? Well, Christopher Rufo is somebody who almost nobody knew about before fall of 2020. He's a documentary filmmaker. He has worked at a lot of um, well-known conservative organizations. He was a former fellow at the Heritage Foundation. He was a former Lincoln fellow at the Claremont Institute, a former employee at the Discovery Institute, which is a small lesser known Christian organization. And he's currently a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. So in early September, 2020, he went on the TV show Tucker Carlson Tonight and he totally vilified critical race theory. Some quotes here, um, the videos on YouTube, if you wanna see it, he said, critical race theory has pervaded every institution in the federal government. It has become the default ideology of the federal bureaucracy and it is being weaponized against the American people. He called it cult indoctrination, said, and the danger and destruction it can wreak against core traditional values is unbelievable. And then he urged the president, then President Trump, to immediately issue an executive order abolishing it. And apparently, President, then President Trump was a big fan of Tucker Carlson and might have seen this because the next morning, his chief of staff called Christopher Rufo. And a couple weeks later, this executive order was issued, 13950, combating race and sex stereotyping, turned out that this executive order was really problematic, mostly because it used vague language and what it was describing as being banned. And so a lot of em employment lawyers were really concerned and were warning their organizations that they had to be very, very careful about what kinds of trainings they did with their employees. And so, there were certain terms they said, make sure that you don't discuss implicit bias, affirmative accommodating differences, systemic discrimination, microaggressions, because any of these things might be interpreted as um, defying this executive order and could land you in big trouble. So effectively, this executive order prohibited speech that addressed anything related to diversity and inclusion. And it was applied to all current and prospective federal contractors, subcontractors, federal grant recipients, and US military, as well as federal agencies and agency employees. So, you know, anybody getting federal government monies was now feeling at risk and having to think about really hard what topics were being discussed with employees, what kinds of trainings were happening within their organizations. So then, there was a whole organized campaign that started. After Rufo went on Tucker Carlson and the executive order came out, there were some headlines about this executive order. People were a little bit up in arms about it, but nothing was really in the media about critical race theory again for several months until certain think tanks like the Manhattan Institute and the Heritage um, Foundation were starting to organized to notify legislators that they should be worried about critical race theory in their states. And so these think tanks actually started to create toolkits, what you can do to protect your state, your school systems from critical race theory. This was all funded by Charles Koch and his late brother. So lots of money, billionaire brothers behind this, right? Um, so well-organized campaign, lots of materials, lots of access to the media, access to politicians. 
um, the Cato Institute, the American Heritage Foundation, the American Enterprise Institute, all involved in this really well-constructed campaign. <clears throat> so in early 2021, that's when we started to see legislators paying attention to critical race theory and proposing legislation at their state level to ban the teaching of critical race theory in different kinds of schools, in K through 12 schools, in public higher education institutions, and also running, I think one of the ones that really made it in the news was in Florida, trying to require all higher ed faculty to take a survey that would reveal if they were using critical race theory and had too much ideology about race and racism. At this point in time, more than 27 states have introduced legislation that restricts speech about either racial justice, critical race theory, or the teaching of racial injustice in American history, and 14 states have passed that legislation. So this is very popular, but again, very much um, organized by this campaign. And so many of these bans use the exact same language that has been given to them by think tanks. The American Heritage Foundation and ALEC, if you're not familiar with them and you watch Netflix's 13th, you will become familiar with them. They provide trainings to people in various communities to try and get those people to organize around CRT bans and to go and speak out in their um, school districts, go to the school boards and fight against any use of CRT, supposedly. So at this point, there's really, there has been a media explosion this summer. Um, if you read different news sources, you probably saw multiple headlines that referred to um, critical race theory, to diversity trainings, to CRT in the schools, to the CRT bans and legislation being proposed in different states. Um, it has really, really gotten bigger and bigger over time. And it's being framed a lot as if it's a grassroots movement, it's a populist movement, but in reality, it has been orchestrated um, by institutions with a lot of power and money. So why does this matter? Why, why is it important for us to know about this and think about it and be aware of how it all came to be? Well, the first thing is, I wanna show you on the right side of the screen, this list of terms that hopefully you can read them. I know it's a little blurry. It was hard to get a good shot off the internet, but how parents can I identify whether critical race theory is being taught in their children's classrooms? And as a social scientist, when I look at this list, I think it's very alarming because many of the terms on this list are terms that social scientists use on a regular basis. Terms like ethnocentricity, identity, normative, power structures, these are basic terms that any student who takes an introduction to sociology class will learn and will learn about. They're in all introductory sociology textbooks. So these terms do not imply that critical race theory is being used or applied in any conversation, right? These are basic social science terms. CRT has been framed as being nefarious, anti-American, it has to be stopped to save Western civilization. It's being framed as anti-patriotic and as racist, which is really a brilliant move, a brilliant spin on trying to destroy a theory that is used to identify systemic racism, to call it racist, right? Like brilliant, if you can make that happen, really, really smart approach but I would argue that it is not racist. <laughs> this matters because there are effects on kids. Kids, as I said, we know that race and racism are social facts. And so children are getting exposed to it all the time. And if adults can't talk about it, then they don't have a language to articulate and understand their experiences. For students and kids of color, this is especially damaging because not being able to talk about it erases their identities and their personal lived experiences. This is really problematic for teachers, all of these CRT bans and just this uproar over CRT because 
teachers are afraid to teach about anything that could be considered controversial. Teachers aren't teaching critical race theory, but when they're teaching about, in the elementary schools, when they're teaching about racism, when they're teaching about privilege, when they're teaching about slavery, CRT is being used as code to say, oh, they're doing something bad, they're doing something anti-American. And so teachers are actually having their lives threatened, their safety threatened, um, their jobs threatened. Some teachers have lost their jobs already. Um, this is a picture of Matthew Hahn. He actually did lose his job after he showed a YouTube video about white privilege and also taught his students about a ta Coates poem that was about um, then President Donald Trump, and he was fired for that. Although the school board claimed that he was actually fired because the YouTube video that he showed to high schoolers included um, bad words. And so he lost his job. It's not the only example. A woman in Florida lost her job over the um, supposed teaching of CRT or similar topics. And really, I mean, there's some, some of the bans have language that say that you could be breaking the law if you teach about anything that makes somebody uncomfortable because of who they are or their lived experience. Think about that as an educator to not be able to make students uncomfortable in the topics that you're discussing really limits what you can teach about and how comfortable you can feel as a teacher. People can feel uncomfortable about anything. You can't always predict that happening. And in my classroom, if my students aren't feeling a little bit uncomfortable about whatever we're discussing, then they're probably not learning and growing. So this is really problematic. And the last point I wanna make is that many of the people who are critical race theory proponents say that a CRT analysis of this campaign against CRT indicates that it's part of a constellation of policies that are eroding our democratic republic. It's related to limitations on free speech, related to limitations on free protest, related to limitations on voting rights and other voting restrictions. So this is part of a bigger um, kind of culture war and part of a bigger political strategy. And that is probably the, um, the most abstract, the most important thing that many of the originators of CRT would wanna point out at this moment in time. Um, I think that's it. I've used up all my time, I'm pretty sure. Um, I have some recommendations. If you're interested in learning more about these things, a few book recommendations, 13th on Netflix is really good, but really dense. The African American Policy Forum, which is headed up by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, um, they have a great campaign called Truth Be Told, which is tracking all of the bans and legislation against CRT. Um, they have lots of different information. They've been collecting news stories. And for anyone who's a teacher, some select resources on anti-racist teaching that I just wanted to make available. So this is recorded, so you'll be able to see that at some other point. Well, thank you, uh, Meredith, and uh, with, uh, I'll open it up to questions and discussion. So please, people, um, if Mary will uh, let people unmute themselves, then people should be free to either ask questions in person or they can put questions in the chat. There was uh, one question in the chat for, uh, about the name of the other woman. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, that's Mari Matsuda. I'm, Genesis, I'm assuming you mean in that photo of Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw and the other woman at Harvard? A question from Gary Ostrauer in the chat. In light of the legislation regarding making students uncomfortable, are you a critic of safe spaces and trigger warnings? As an educator, I am. Uh, my personal politics, yes, I am. Because trigger warnings and safe spaces, I mean, I want my classroom to feel safe in a way that everyone there is respectful of each other and giving each other the benefit of the doubt. And so we can be vulnerable with each other, ask hard questions, say things that might be controversial, but have a real dialogue. Um, in terms of trigger warnings, I find trigger warnings problematic because I think that they, um, 
preference certain kinds of traumas and sensitivities over others. If we decide as teachers when to give a trigger warning, then we are deciding what kinds of experiences matter to us, who we wanna be sensitive to. And so I think that when I start the semester, I try to talk to students about, um, you know, knowing that we're gonna have hard conversations. We're going to talk about things that affect all of our lives, especially in sociology courses. And we just need to be thoughtful about the words we choose and the way we speak with each other. And, um, you know, I really love Loretta Ross's recent work on calling in versus calling out and really trying to build community and have a productive dialogue with people requires that for us to really come to the table, open, willing to be vulnerable, but really trying to hear each other and give people the benefit of the doubt. Okay. What is the, sorry, what is the difference between safe and brave spaces? I don't know, that's something I haven't thought about. Maybe somebody has um, good oh. response for that. Uh, yeah, I do. I guess I can just respond pretty briefly. Um, but, you know, typically like a safe space is the, um, I guess it connotes like we're all going to feel comfortable. Um, we're going to make sure that, you know, everybody feels included. Uh, and then there's a tendency, I guess, in those spaces to then, I mean, and, and that's all good stuff, right? But then there's a tendency to like maybe, um, you know, to self silence when you feel like maybe what you might be about to say might hurt someone's feelings um, or might be offensive, even if you're questioning, you know, I don't know how to say this. And um, I, uh, you know, I don't know how to say this, but I want to bring it up so that I can work it out. So uh, that there's more of like a self, you know, sort of a self silencing. So a brave space is an opportunity um, for people to ask those questions. You know, I don't know how to say this, but what if I said, you know, this, how would, um, you know, what would that mean? And so it's like an opportunity to like take a risk, even if you're afraid to like offend somebody. Um, you don't, obviously you don't wanna talk in a disrespectful way, but it's like an opportunity to take a risk to say something that you might feel criticized by or um, that you, you know, just trying to kind of work out an idea. And I was going to say that was why I actually put that in there, and it was, and it was that is the difference between them. That um, Meredith, what you said, that idea of the expectation and the requirement of dialogue, the requirement of respect, the requirement of the ability to be able to have differing perspectives and to have them respected, as compared to often that idea of having a a safe space, which can be an echo chamber. It is not always an echo chamber. There is a need for both safe and brave spaces, safe for the emotional aspects. But again, they're going to work in very different ways, but often they get conflated. And so that brave space has the, always has the expectation of, differ, of difference of perspective with respect and the expectation and requirement of dialogue over the long term, whereas safe space is more often a discussion space. Uh, more so than a space for uh, for for longer uh, continuous dialogue. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, your comments, both of your comments, and also Alex's comment in the um, chat are reminding me of Common Ground. This is my first semester teaching Common Ground, and this week is the week where we talk about how to talk to the other side. And so, yesterday with my group, we talked about how problematic that phrase is, right? To say talking to rather than talking with and talking in conversation with someone and the other side, you know, setting us up for being divided and, and thinking about it as um, opposing, opposing opinions and opposing individuals who are going to be at odds. So um, yeah, thanks. I, I appreciate the question. More questions or comments from people? Do you have any suggested frameworks for these difficult discussions uh, from Jesse Santana? Um, I don't use any specific, you know, theoretical frameworks, but I tend, I, I tend to think that <laughs> I, I aggregate a bunch of frameworks into my mind and just apply them in a way that feels right with each 
um, context, each group of students, or you know, if it's adults, whatever the context is. Um, and I will say again, you know, Dr. Loretta Ross's work, especially, I love using that in my classes. I love talking with students about her work and her her experiences in life and her teachings. Um, so yeah, I would say no single framework that I have. Yeah, and, and thanks, Brian. Brian suggested the Sustained Dialogues Institute um, for resources. Okay, the questions. Well, I'll, I'll ask a question, Meredith. Uh, when you, when you um, are talking about the disagreements you're likely to encounter and that, and um, I mean, would it be correct to say that uh, from the standpoint of critical race theory, um, systematic racism is simply a fact? Yeah. Like, like global warming is a fact. Absolutely. I, and that's one of the um, reasons why it's under attack because, you know, Systemic racism is something that's hard for a lot of people to swallow. You know, to accept that racism is built into our social institutions and that even if we individually do not feel that we are racist and that we want equality for everyone or even equity, right? To know that we are living within systems that are perpetuating racist experiences and racist outcomes. That is really hard for people to swallow. Um, and so, yeah, the issue of systemic racism, CRT absolutely says is, is a fact. It's a social reality. But does that mean it, it's a fact, um, as it were, uh, in society at large? Or would, are you saying that it would be a fact in almost any, inst within any institution? I don't, I don't see those things as separate. Um, I mean, I think if we talk, if we had a bigger conversation about um, Western society and colonialism and, you know, the global histories of different cultures and power structures, um, yeah, I, maybe I'm not understanding your question, but I don't see them as separate. <laughs> well, uh, you know, would you say that uh, from the standpoint of critical race theory, Take any school, take any hospital, take any business, take any nonprofit organization, you would expect to find systemic racism there. Yeah. You would. CRT would say that, yeah. If I was approaching the any institution with a CRT lens, I would say that, yes. Okay. Um, there are other questions in the chat. Yeah, sorry. What is Gary's question? Did I miss one? Sorry. The, the, the question I asked was, how, how would you fit the 1619 project? And for people who may be unfamiliar with that, the 1619 project is, uh, was sponsored by the New York Times. And it's essentially a rewriting of American history from the perspective of, uh, I guess I would say, critical race theory. Uh, but I'm not sure you would say that. And I'm not sure whether you're familiar yourself with the 1619 project. So I was basically asking, how would you fit the 1619 project, if you are familiar with it, into what you are saying? Yeah, I mean, so I am familiar with it. And within this broader discourse around CRT, the 1619 project has been vilified in the same way that CRT has been. Um, I, it's an interesting question to ask if I think that the 1619 project was written from a, or we could claim that it was written from a CRT perspective. Um, I haven't thought about that. It's probably likely that that's something that could be argued, um, but I haven't thought about it in that way specifically. Well, the, the reason I guess I would think it is, uh, is that the 1619 project essentially says that the founding of America was uh, 1619, not 1607 when the Jamestown settlers first arrived, white settlers from England, but rather in 1619 when the first Africans, 20 Africans, were imported into Jamestown. And uh, essentially, uh, you know, connects the uh, history of not just racism, but uh, slavery itself into the fabric of almost every element of American history. Slavery until, of course, 1865, and then, uh, you know, in 
different varieties, uh, you know, since 1865, since the end of the Civil War. And the, the reason I mention it in part is because, you know, critical race theory has been mentioned on Fox News about two to 3,000 times in the last nine months. Uh, it's become a real boogeyman. It's really become a uh, uh, you know, there was a war on Christmas. Well, now it's a war on critical race theory. And there's a great deal of hysteria, real hysteria. It's going to, you know, as you said yourself, uh, lead to the destruction of Western civilization, the destruction of all of American values, and so forth. And yet the 1619 project, which I think at least is very, very very much connected to the teaching of critical race theories in high schools, not before high schools, uh, has some real problems. I mean, that's history, I think. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty weak. And some of the critics of the 1619 project are some of the very, very best historians uh, of the, uh, uh, you know, of the subject of race, of the subject of the Civil War, two of whom, I might add, uh, were Russell lecturers here at Alfred University, Peter Colchin, who wrote a brilliant study of comparing Russian serfdom to American slavery, uh, and Alan Gelzo, who spoke here about five or six years ago, who is one of the two or three best Lincoln scholars in the United States. So, I mean, you know, I don't want to get into the details of this because this is your talk, not mine, but uh, uh, I, I, I do think that, you know, somehow or another, the whole subject of 1619 has to be dealt with within the context of this larger framework of CRT. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of other questions, uh, Meredith. Um, Christine Culp, um, where is it? Yeah. It's asked, if, if CRT was developed to analyze the law to root out systemic racism, then how can it be taught to primary school children? I mean, I think part of what is implied in, in my talk about it is that I don't think CRT as a theory can be taught to elementary school children. I think that's why it's, it's code for finding it problematic when other kinds of race related topics are taught to elementary school children. And, you know, it, it was developed for use in the in arguing court cases and, and critically analyzing the law and legal structures. Um, but as you hopefully saw in my talk, it, it has been applied to other contexts and it will continue to be applied to other contexts. But yeah, I think it's, it's quite a, a reach to say, oh, it's being taught in elementary schools. I mean, it's, it's a, from what I've told you about it, I think that it sounds really deep and heavy and complex. And I don't think it's something that an elementary school teacher would try to introduce to second graders or fourth graders even, you know. Um, I do want to just make one other comment in response to Gary's comment, which is, yeah, I'm not a historian and I wouldn't say that I am a great assessor of different historical narratives, you know, versions of history. Um, but I still find it problematic that the 1619 project is being banned from being taught in schools because I think, you know, showing that as one of many perspectives and discussing what are the strengths and weaknesses of these different versions of history and these narratives and how they're framed is really valuable. Um, Sandra Singer just asked a question to you or to anyone. Does anyone know what the situation is in our local schools? I assume regarding um, things we've been talking about. I do not, and I've been wondering that too, but I am, I have connections with a few people um, who I probably would have heard about it from them if it was a topic in our school district. One is on the school board um, and he speaks his politics very openly all the time, um, whether you wanna hear it or not. And I haven't heard him mention this, so I'm not sure, but it's a great question. And, and Brian Saltzman had a comment on something that was said earlier. Yeah, I was going to say my response is I think is very similar to to, to what Meredith said um, for Gary's comment that um, and you know any of you who are teaching uh, in the in the FYE program I'm gonna, I'm going to bring up one of the lovely terms that we use informational literacy and, and, and Kevin as well um, the idea of informational literacy. The idea that we need to understand where those particular perspectives are coming from and be able to use them amongst a series of, of perspectives. 
I think that there is there is there is truth and there is information within that particular space, and it has opened up a dialogue and an opportunity uh, for the larger uh, institution and for the larger society to have a conversation that challenges, in some cases, the um, in some cases what people believe to be the sacrosanct. Uh, idea of, of, of history and what the history of this country is, and then talking about the ways in which the rights, opportunities of the first African uh, citizens, the first African and Black landowners in the United States and their experiences, and how we have seen some of the roots, not the complete roots, but some of the roots of, the, uh, of systemic and institutional racism specifically uh, targeted and the loss of land in Virginia um, during that time previous to 1865, previous to 1619, uh, previous to all of those times and see there was success and opportunity, but those narratives are important to understanding the entire, a portion of the entire story. So I think that that's where it fits in and ultimately understanding that critical race theory is a framework, is an opportunity that again was stuck in the legal space, but ultimately gives us an opportunity to look at it from a broader space. And we as critical uh, thinkers and as critical consumers of information need to understand and be literate in, in understanding what we believe, why we believe it, and how we have come to believe those particular narratives. So that's where I think, in my opinion, that's where it, it fits in and that's how I approach it uh, in the spaces where I have opportunities to speak to larger groups. But thank you for uh, everyone for a very interesting discussion. And thank you, Meredith, for a wonderful talk, wonderful presentation that really gave uh, us a lot to think about and connected beautifully with um, things that have been talked about in courses, uh, uh, in uh, FYE, in Common Ground and all across the university. So given that she is obviously not able to rejoin. We'll applaud her in her absence and uh, hope to see you all at the roundtable discussion at 5.30. Thank you.